Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I had a very interesting interview earlier today with uh, Alex Smith from uh, Radio EcoShock, EcoShock Radio, and uh, we talked about the Arctic, we talked about um, the coronavirus, we talked about the some of the uh, problems that we're having, um, you know, in geopolitics and you know, we, we went through the gamut and we even talked about some of the um, solutions that I recommend uh, for dealing with our accelerating abrupt uh, climate change. But the focus of this video and the next few um, is the global food supply. Abrupt climate system change risks uh, taking down large parts of the global food supply and of course that would wreak havoc on the planet it would wreak havoc on many many countries you know in the west um, where a small fraction of the average person's income you know in many countries is is spent on food you know there, there's there's uh many places where billions of people um are stretched to the limit to put food on their table. So with global food prices uh, spiking up, these people, you know, will be, their, their supply will be f severely threatened. So I'm gonna talk all about um, the ongoing threats and risks to the global food supply, because it's not, this is not something for 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it's happening right now. So, you know, it, with our warming planet, uh, agriculture, a lot of agricultural places are shifting towards the poles. So in the Northern Hemisphere, that's shifting north. So I'll take Canada as, as an example. In Canada now, there's about, we have about a million square kilometers of our farmland. It's presently warm enough and suitable for growing crops like wheat, corn, and potatoes. If you look at the climate models, by 2080, and I would say it's a lot sooner than that, there'll be an additional roughly 4.2 million square kilometers um, of Canada that will become suitable climate-wise for growing the, these you know, things like the wheat, corn, and potatoes. But the problem is, is the soils will, not, will take a long, long time to build up to allow these you know any of these lands to be productive for growing these things the climate will be suitable but then you have to build up the soil right now a lot of these lands in canada that will become suitable for farming are presently boreal forests and there's a lot of conifers and not so many so many deciduous trees so you know if you've got deciduous trees and the leaves fall um they fall you know, they form in the spring and they fall down to the ground in the fall and they provide litter, what's called leaf litter, which will, can then over time develop into soils and you can get it, build up a thick layer of soils. But most of the northern boreal forests of Canada are coniferous. So these are fir trees, pine trees that don't, they don't uh, lose their leaves. They don't have, they, they don't lose their, they lose some needles, but nowhere near as many as deciduous trees produce so it takes really really long time for the soils to build up it's very very rocky parts of the canadian shield um, and uh, you know the, the soil there is extremely thin and very very acidic you know the soils tend to be acidic in uh, the soils under coniferous forests so you know when the climate is suitable for switching to crop growth there it's going to take an awful long time for the soils to develop. Now, there's 12 major crops in the world, roughly, and globally, by 2080 or so, we'll have an increase of about 30% of the land area where the climate will be suitable for growing more crops. That 30% is about 15.1 million square kilometers globally. So 4.2 alone is in Canada, and in Canada, you know, the, the land available for growing crops that jumped from 1 million today to 5.2 million, right? An additional 4.2 million, that's a five times increase. Um, you know, areas like Canada and Russia, you know, and mountainous areas in some parts of the world, like near the tropics will become, will have areas that are more suitable to growing 
crops, but again, it takes time for the soils to build up. But the other wild factor is these, these forest fires, these wildfires. So if you look at Australia and California, we're getting tremendous wildfires and they're already starting in California and Australia's had some very bad years. And these very quickly take down a forest and leave the ash behind. And the ash is very, very fertile. It has a lot of nutrients and so on to the soils. So it does increase the rate at which the soils um, develop. But the, you know, the present wildfire threats in Australia and California and Siberia and other places, these will, these, these are like foreshadowing what will happen in Canada, you know, and Russia um, when, depending on the moisture or rainfall precipitation regimes. So, you know, there's a lot of factors in the equation um, it's not just the boreal forests in Canada, it's the peat in the permafrost and tundra regions where we are getting more fires, but you know, the vast amounts of forests are, it's only a small fraction of them that are presently being affected. You know, if it becomes like, to the, to the extent of what we're seeing in California and Australia, then, then Canada and Russia will be severely impacted by these in the, in the near future. So, um, you know, and I'm I'm focusing my discussion on glo on global food supply mostly on um, agriculture and land based food supply. You know, the food supply from the ocean, from both um, harvesting um, far you know uh, fish farms and and things close to coastlines. You know, and uh, you know the the uh, you know the other fishing, deep water fishing, etc. I'm not really going to touch on there in these videos, this video and the next few, those are topics for future discussion. Um, a Twitter uh, friend, uh, Jim Baird, has put together a lot of lists on agriculture and I'm using some of his um, lists and I'll show you those those tweets when I when I get to the um, computer screen. But uh, basically, you know, getting back to food now, so, so water and hydrology is going to be a huge issue. I mean, in order to have vegetation growth, of course, you need water. So, you know, and we know that the jet streams are shifting and the water regime, regimes are, are changing. So, but getting back to food while potentially opening up new growing regions, you know, climate change is already impacting well-established growing regions. And, um, I'm going to go through and, and mention 10 primary effects right now where climate change is impacting food supply, global food supply negatively. And then I'll talk about 10 secondary effects um, which are also negatively impacting food supply. Um, and I'll discuss them, I'll, I'll mention them now and I'll show you evidence of uh, I'll show you the details in some subsequent videos as I go through the websites and show you these these articles. So the first is to do with heat and heat stress. Okay, so heat stress, so point one, primary effect, heat stress is reducing crop yields, right? Crops like to, they have a range of temperature and precipitation where you get the highest yields and if you go outside those range and yields drop. The heat stress is also um, affecting farmers, right? So, you know, and sometimes it's fatal. So farmers working their fields, um, you know, if it's super hot, super humid, that obviously cuts yields. They're not able to spend um, the hottest parts of the day out in their fields. Also, heat stress on livestock is often fatal and it's affecting huge numbers of livestock. So we're talking goats, cattle, uh, sheep, uh, chickens, um, all kinds of different livestock. Altered precipitation patterns are, of course, obviously um, detrimental to growing food and to agriculture. So not enough rain, drought conditions. Okay, um, you know, we're trying to get more drought resistant crops, but many crops just can't grow um, under drought conditions. In fact, most of them the other, on the other side of the coin, too much rain and flooding is, is uh, and, and these, these effects are from the jet streams shifting and becoming much slower and wavier and getting stuck in place, stalling out. And uh, 
you know, weather blocking, for example. And these uh, jet stream patterns are encompassing larger and larger areas. The blocking events are covering larger and larger areas and negatively impacting crop growth in those areas. Weather whiplashing is another important factor. Increasingly, we're seeing a pattern of whiplash between drought, flooding, drought, flooding, drought, flooding, which further um, exacerbates the impacts and degrades crops. Extreme weather patterns are also physically damaging crops. So talking about large hailstorms, for example, we're talking about late frost in the spring or and also early snowfall in the fall. So often we're getting warm weather early on in the year and that's confusing plants and they're starting to bud and then we'll get a killing frost which, which severely damages and kills all the buds that have already occurred. And, uh, you know, hopefully with many plants, secondary buds will form, but that's not the case in, in, in some cases. They, it's just wrecked that crop for the, the season. Wildfire, of course, I've mentioned, and it's physically destroying crops and livestock. But it's not just the wildfire. The smoke and other pollutants from wildfires are damaging crops a long way away from the actual fires. Okay, for example, the California fires or um, fires in Australia, they can be hundreds and hundreds of kilometers from wine growing regions, but the, the smoke and ash um, actually destroys the, the grape. Not destroys them, but it gives a smoky, uh, tart taste, you know, a smoky, weird taste to the grapes and some, um, some, uh, places that some wine producing regions they just they just forget about that year because there's a there's a strange taste to the wine that comes from those grapes they've been tainted by the wildfire smoke extreme weather is also causing damage or disruption to the food transportation right to the storage infrastructure like grain elevators and things and also to the cold chain to keep uh you know foods uh preserved so that they can be transported to market. So all of these things are primary effects in that they're primary ways in which uh, climate change today is negatively impacting our global food supply. All of these above effects are already cascading into a variety of secondary effects. So secondary effects are things like crop and farm failures, financing challenges for farmers, migration of populations, farmer suicides, general strikes. Um, how many people have, how many of you have heard of the, in, what's going on in India last week? The largest strike in history, 200 million farm people on strike, including most of the farmers just last week. You know, the, this, uh, all this unrest, it leads to the loss of agricultural labor and to resource conflict, okay? Lots of, you know, look at Syria, farmers couldn't produce, move into the cities, uh, no jobs, basically civil war, the country dis is destroyed. These are, these are spin-on effects from climate change wiping out uh, farming. Crop stress, okay? Uh, seed viability damages, Okay, so the seeds actually can get damaged from this, uh, these abrupt climate change events and, and stressed crops. Stressed crops produce stressed seeds, essentially. So that leads to poor crops in subsequent years. There's drought and sea level rise, and that causes salinization of the soils and farmland nearby the coast is another secondary effect. Heat, drought, and the overuse of pesticides, uh, you know, it can basically lead to uh, you know the the pesticides to wipe out beetles and and uh, but they also can can harm butterflies and other pollinators for example so that's another secondary effect um, changing precipitation patterns improve the breeding of locusts and other pests drought leads to soil loss and desertification drought also decreases the amount of glaciers and groundwater infiltration the water that's stored um, in rivers, rivers dry out, uh, and that's water stress in subsequent years. Flooding, of course, too much water carries over into another growing season, and crop loss Im impacts food prices in subsequent years. So are we going to a Soylent Green situation? I'll discuss that. Please uh, watch my subsequent videos. Thank you for listening.